Hi, welcome back to MedChutes. In today's tutorial, we're going to discuss pandemics, infection modelling, and also briefly discuss the outbreak of novel coronavirus 19, also now known as SARS coronavirus 2. We'll discuss that a little bit more towards the end and we'll use it interspersed throughout the tutorial as an example of the concepts. But the main thing I want to discuss today is the idea of what is a pandemic, how does it differ from an epidemic, and how do we model these diseases in the first place. So we'll cover a few different things. This tutorial will explain some concepts such as the idea of R0, uh, also the SIR model, which is one of the main models that we use for basic infection modelling. We'll discuss things about how vaccines work, a little bit on herd immunity, um, and also ways, things that we do to try and control outbreaks. Um, and then, as I mentioned, at the end, we're going to discuss a little bit about coronavirus and how it compares to previous uh, kind of infectious disease outbreaks uh, and why we're worried about it and why we get worried about uh, different new disease outbreaks in general. So to start off with, I'm going to come back to a few of these diagrams at the end. This here is uh, just the coronavirus. Uh, an enhanced kind of visualization of it, I guess. We're going to come back to this graph a little bit later as well. This is the SIR graph. Um, but to start off with, you'll hear this term thrown around a lot, and I think it's important to start off with what exactly an R naught is. R naught is thrown out all the time when we talk about infectious disease um, and epidemics and outbreaks and things like that. The R naught of a particular infection, it isn't a fixed variable and it changes depending on uh, the population, things like that. But what it basically is, it's the basic reproduction number, reproduction number, and it is essentially how many people will get sick. So if this person is sick, how many in new infections will this one person cause? Um, so an R naught of two, means that for every one person that's sick, they each person that is sick will infect two more people. An R naught of three means that they have they'll infect three people. An R naught of 0.5 means that for every two people that are sick, only one other person will get sick. We these terms are important because we use them to define when an epidemic is occurring. So if R naught is equal to one it means that levels are stable in the population and each person that's infected will probably only infect one other person. If R0 is less than one, then it means that it's going to be, it's decreasing the population. So if you have an infection curve that's like this, this is time and this is number of cases, it shoots up, it might stabilize for a little bit and then it will go back down and usually we'll find a steady state at which it hovers. In this period here, this is R0 is equal to 1. In this period here, R0 is less than 1. And in this period here, this is when R0 is greater than 1. So for each person, when R0 is greater than 1, each person that's infected is infecting more than one other person. And the, the greater the R0, the more people are being infected per case. And each of these new cases that gets infected also infects the same number of cases on average. So it's a statistical term. Um, and when your R0 is greater than 1, you're said to be in an epidemic. Uh, R0-1 is like an endemic kind of disease. Endemic diseases typically fluctuate a little bit between all these things at different points in the year. So an example is flu. Uh, so flu kind of sits at a steady state uh, throughout the year. Then as you get closer to winter, the R0 starts to increase because there's greater contacts and things like that. And it shoots up. Um, but R0 greater 1 is epidemic. And by what an epidemic is, is it just means that the number of cases is increasing over time. That's all epidemics are. And we can specify this, we can say uh, in a particular area, in a particular city, in a particular country, within particular demographics. Uh, so for example, um, in certain um, 
certain groups there isn't currently outbreaks and epidemics of uh, certain sexually transmitted diseases and things like that so it's called an epidemic when the number of cases is kind of increasing in, in an exponential fashion over time and it's exponential because of this thing each time someone gets infected they infect more people than each of those people infects more etc etc the r naught as i said it's a bit of, it's a statistical thing and what it how you calculate it is um the chance of a single contact causing an infection so the chance of infection in a single contact um so that's usually a percentage so it's like or a decimal sorry so like say there's a 50 percent chance that each time you can't get into contact with someone that's sick you're going to get the infection so 0.5 is quite high uh, chance of infection multiplied by the number of contacts divided by the length of the infection. Now, as I say, this is kind of like a basic um, modeling characteristic. Things get complicated as soon as you start bringing in asymptomatic carriers, uh, super spreaders, all that kind of thing. So when we do... Um, Sorry about that. When we calculate um, R naught, it's an average over the population, so including people that are super spreaders, um, all that kind of thing. So R naught, the chance that each single encounter is going to result in an infection times the number of encounters or the number of contacts divided by the length of infection. So if you've got a really prolonged infective period, you're going to have a much uh, longer period of time in which you can cause the disease. Cool. Moving on now to the SIR model, and we'll come back to these concepts a bit later on. Um, cool. SIR model. This is, again, very basic modeling onto which we then add further kind of uh, equations, we add in further groups, all that kind of thing. But the basic idea of the SIR model is that people move from susceptible to infected, and then we call this one removed or recovered. I prefer the term removed because we can remove people in a number of different ways. So the idea is that you've got most of the population sitting here, there's a small population here, and then an ever-growing population in the R group. And if I go back to this graph I had before, you can see that that if you start off with everyone in the population is susceptible, as the infection increases, people are moved from the susceptible category into the recovered category. And we also assume that there's no reinfection. So once people move from this group through to this group via here, then they're no longer able to go back. That's the basic idea behind the SIR model. What that means, um, we and we calculate that using epidemiology and things like that. So during an outbreak, it's very hard to calculate all these kinds of details because uh, we don't get very good statistics usually. A lot of funds are being diverted into, mon into managing outbreaks rather than necessarily getting the full epide epidemiological extent. So there's a lot of people that will be asymptomatic and won't present. But when you do uh, serotype studies in the future, you'll see that a much greater population was actually infected and just never presented to healthcare or never showed symptoms. So often in the early stage of an outbreak, these things, are, so R0, lethality, all those kinds of things, typically are overrepresented or overestimated because we only see the really sick people that end up coming into hospital. So people move from here through to here through to uh, the removed or recovered section. The susceptible population is typically what determines the spread. The more susceptible people you have in the population, the more, the greater the infection can spread. And you can imagine this is kind of like a network. So you have one person here and each person is connected in a vast network of various contacts and people can connect these via various groups and there's intersections and 
lots of interplays, like nodes in a network. As you can see, this is a good way of modeling kind of the population in that we have certain nodes. So you'll notice like this, this person here, this person here, and this person here, um, they're kind of nodes in which they kind of connect between groups, but they also have large connections to people outside of the, the kind of network, I guess. There's lots of people that branch off them. So if this person was to get sick, they would have contacts with all these people. Whereas if this person got sick, the only contact they have is with this person. These people in the center of the network are what we call, they have the potential to become super spreaders. So people that have very large numbers of contacts. As you can see, the larger the population of susceptible, if we have um, an R naught of two, let's say, and we start off with this person here being sick, by chance, this person gets sick and this person gets sick. This person no longer has any contacts, they end up isolating themselves, something like that. Then, but this person continues to have contacts and these two people get sick and then these two people get sick and then it goes on and it goes on and it grows and grows and grows. You can see that when there's more nodes to kind of infect, the infection can spread faster, especially if something like an R naught of two. So let me go get rid of these. Then we get to this idea of I can't remember how it was. We then, if so, with an R naught of two, the more people that are susceptible, the greater, the faster the infection can spread. Um, because at each interaction, this person, two people in the network that it's connected to, are going to get sick. So, how can we remove or reduce the number of susceptible? Uh, and take them to the removed category before they get sick, before they go through that infected stage, because the infected is where the damage really occurs. And the way that we can do that is by vaccinating. So when you vaccinate people, and especially if you target these kind of nodes, so these nodes could be people like healthcare workers, nurses, carers, all those kind of things. Um, people that work in hospitality, all those kinds of areas where there's lots of potential contacts. If you target these people in vaccination campaigns, then what happens is, um, let's say a situation like this, again, R0 of zero, oh, sorry, R0 of two. Let's say this is the, the first case. And then if it's an R0 of two, it tries to spread this way and this way, but it's blocked off because the person's two contacts are both immune and they're already in the removed category. Likewise, if we start here, we'll try again. We can go this way and this way. And so these two people get sick, but then it can't go any further to this, to this person here, because it can't get down there. All these people are now safe. And this one, again, it'll spread here, it'll spread here, but then it's blocked again as opposed to when everyone was susceptible. So when everyone was susceptible, it could just spread like wildfire. There were no none of these roadblocks in the way. Vaccination provides roadblocks and helps block us. And especially if we target healthcare workers, uh, people who work in hospitality, people that work with a lot of people. Um, if we target those people with high numbers of contacts, we can help prevent uh, the outbreaks and the epidemics and you can slow the disease process right down. This concept here is what we call herd immunity. So even in this case, we've only vaccinated the healthcare workers per se. Then you see that all these people that didn't get the vaccine are still protected because this person here did get it. And that's the idea behind vaccination. If you're in a hospital um, full of people that are really sick and really susceptible uh, to viral infections, say, for example, influenza, by immunizing the healthcare worker against influenza, you help, you help all these people who couldn't get the vaccine because they were too sick. And none of these people now can will get it because you've blocked it. 
you need you need to hit a certain level of vaccination within the population in order to achieve this effect because you can imagine if we only vaccinated half as many people then there was a person there it could still kind of spread around and then from here it would spread to all these nodes so you need to hit a certain percentage of the population in order to achieve this herd immunity status and that varies depending on the bug so for example measles and uh and other highly infectious uh, organisms require a minimum kind of vaccination status. I think it's around at least 90% of the population needs to be immunized in order to have this herd immunity effect. There are other uh, viruses which are significantly less than that, but still it's usually at least 70% of the population or greater. And again, if you target these people who are the nodes, you can help uh, further reduce that number. So that's how... So vaccines, the reason we like vaccines is they help lower the number of susceptible people and take them to the removed so that p less people can become infected and it slows the infection rate right down. And if you look at this as well, basically what you're doing is you're removing the number of susceptible contacts. So in some ways you're kind of changing this a little bit, but you're mainly affecting this and you're making this get lower. The next thing to talk about then is um, antivirals and medications. The way antivirals work is that in this infected state, this is when people can uh, target other susceptible individuals and make them infected. This is the people, this is when they're spreading. So this is the length of infection. And I know this probably doesn't make sense. There's some other maths that goes on here as well, because obviously um, a longer infection means a higher R naught. So I think that this is actually, there should be a time somewhere in here. I think I've written the equation out wrong, but ignore that for the moment. <laughs> so the length of infection is one of the other variables that we need to be aware of. What the, what antivirals do is they lower the length of infection. And by lowering the length of infection, it decreases the time in which this spread can occur. And it also decreases the chance of infection in a lot of cases because it decreases viral load and decreases how much um, viral shedding is happening. Um, so in particular, it, it also helps because really, really sick patients, so example, patients in the ICU have much higher viral loads and shed much more and they can become these super spreaders. And by uh, giving them antivirals, we can reduce the amount of virus that they're shedding and therefore decrease the chance of infection as well as the length of infection. And what both of those things will do is it means that you get a smaller R naught. The other thing we can do is we can quarantine people. And by quarantining people, we limit their contacts. So again, we target this thing here. And by targeting the limiting the number of contacts, we again limit the R naught and how quickly it can spread. Because essentially, what you'll be doing is knocking out these connections in the network. So now, rather than having, say, for example, this person here infected and being able to spread it to everyone else, you've isolated them, and this person is now locked in locked in their house or whatever, and it doesn't matter how many people they were connected to before, while they're sick and infective, they're no longer able to transmit to anyone else. You've isolated that, that case. So that's the idea behind quarantine. What makes us worried in pandemics? There's a few things. So things that we talk about are often lethality. This is an important one. Lethality is an interesting kind of case. And if you've ever played Plague Incorporated, which, by the way, I would highly recommend everyone have a go at this because it actually uses real-world uh, epidemic disease modeling. Um, so it's quite a good... It's got a really good uh, driver in it. It's really fun. But uh, you, one of the things you'll notice is that lethality comes at a cost, and it typically comes at a cost of um, how infectious it is. By infectious, I mean how easily it can spread, how... Uh, not quite virulent, but yeah, how quickly it can spread. So if you're a highly lethal virus, 
such as Ebola, one of the trade-offs that happens is that you can kill people too quickly. And if you kill people too quickly, you actually affect the length of infection and the number of contacts you can have because you can't keep going around visiting people once you're dead. One of the reasons Ebola spread so quickly is because of uh, death practices uh, in the areas where it occurred, which involved um, a lot of handling of the body by the family and things like that before the burial. Because of that, they kept transmitting after death, where in a lot of other cultures, less bodily ha body handling occurs. Therefore, there's less contacts. And once a person's dead, the infectivity drop drops right off. So lethality typically comes at a cost. So 50% virulent uh, lethal infection, sorry. Yes, we're worried about. But more worryingly is typically the ones that are like maybe 10 to 15%. The reason those ones are kind of worrying is that often they, the people, people live, more people live with the virus, more people living the virus means more potential contacts, um, more interactions between uh, the susceptible population and therefore they have uh, increased spread and a higher number of potential people to die. So um, say you have a 50% lethal infection it might only be able to spread to a hundred people before it eventually kind of kills all the susceptible people in the population and everyone moves from this point to here because it's just too too lethal and it kills everyone off before it has a chance to spread so in that case 50 people it will die which is awful don't get me wrong um, but with population health, we also, you, you to be looking at a big picture kind of thing. You have 10 to 15% uh, lethality, but it has greater time to spread, can spread further. You might have a thousand people infected, in which case you're going to have 100 to 150 people dead by the time it kind of gets under control. And the greater the infectivity, the greater it can spread, the more kind of worried we are. And... I guess the lower lethality we can, we kind of are worried about, um, because if you have infected a hundred thousand people, and you've got a lethality rate of two percent, that is a significant uh, number of people that are still going to be dying. Um, even though the overall mortality is, is low, two percent is actually still very high. And I'll give you a few examples of different um, the different lethality rates for different viruses. So, lethality is one thing, and I've kind of touched about it. The other thing that we worry about in outbreaks is the infectivity of the virus. This is one of the things that's quite worrying about SARS coronavirus 2, the disease, the virus that's causing COVID-19. It has very, it appears to be very, very contagious. Um, so it can spread very rapidly. And if you spread very rapidly, you've got a much bigger pool. You've got a much bigger pie with which you can people die. So let's say again, oh, two percent lethality rate, which is appears to be what COVID is. If you've got a small pie, uh, and let's say this was Ebola and it had fifty percent lethality, smaller pie, but larger proportion of it people died. <coughs> Whereas we've got a much bigger pie because of the high infectivity. And even though it's a smaller segment, it's only the 2%, the area of this is actually greater than the area of that. And the bigger the pie is, same 2%, but it's bigger and bigger and bigger. So the high infectivity is one of the other reasons we're worried. This is what happens when we talk about uh, new viruses and why we're worried about that. So typically, if it's a pre-existing virus like influenza, we have vaccines and things like that. And similar to herd immunity, we have people that um, are naturally immune to the virus. They've had a mild version of it. They still have some uh, some protection from previous years, that kind of thing. So. It, say this person has got some natural immunity, this person here has got some natural immunity, this person here. So if this person gets sick, that person will get sick, it gets to here and it's blocked. This person got sick, it gets blocked. 
Um, and this person gets sick. It's blocked here. It's blocked here. It's blocked there. It might get down here and infect these people. Sure, cool. What we worry about with these newly emerged viruses is that there is none of this pre-existing... Um, there is no pre-existing immunity within the population. There might be very, very small amounts of people that are good responders um, and can fight off the virus very easily without getting too sick and rapidly develop immunity. But when a virus first emerges in the population, there's no pre-existing immunity. And it means that it can very rapidly spread to everyone in the network. So it has a high, it's very, very contagious. So it might be a, a virus that actually has very poor infectivity and you need lots and lots of contacts before it will spread to everyone. And that's what we see in the highly pathogenic avian influenzas. Um, I think that's like H5N9 and things like that. Uh, those highly pathogenic avian influenzas at the moment we are lucky in that they have very low uh, infectious rates and in that it's very hard to get human to human spread. But the thing that we're worried about is that if it does achieve good human to human spread, it will very rapidly move through the network like this because there's no pre existing immunity to any of the antigens uh, in this virus as opposed to the other influences that go around. We also worry about asymptomatic shedding. Uh, and spreading the reason so you would have heard that talked about with COVID-19 uh, and that people are, can be infectious for up to a week or two before they show symptoms the reason why that's worrying is that in a network you know this let's say this person is infected and if they feel start feeling sick they're going to stay home from work especially with all the the media and the publicity they get us they start to get a sniffle they're going to go home, they're going to isolate themselves and prevent anyone else getting sick. But if they start shedding virus before they start feeling ill, before they start feeling sick and decide that they should stay home and not go out anymore, they've already had multiple exposures to many, many, many people. What that means is that they're... Oh, it keeps coming through. Um, so all these people are going to be exposed and could get sick before anyone that notice, notices anything and this person then gets sick and all their contacts start getting uh, infected and so on and so forth until you kind of have this silent epidemic and say it's a two-week incubation period in which you can be shedding but you don't get you don't show symptoms all these people you have a silent epidemic and then suddenly at two weeks time cases start appearing which is similar to what we saw actually in china and what we also saw in South Korea, um, we've also just been, as I speak, uh, we've had a case diagnosed in Queensland and Australia, a new case. And the woman uh, was asymptomatic and returned to work uh, and had multiple contacts with many, many people before she started showing symptoms. So it's, a, and it's an example of this case where it actually happens now there's a big screening process happening, trying to find all the people who may have had contact with her, all the people that those people had contact with, and the net spreads very, very, very rapidly. It's also why, you know, we, we're kind of happy when we have asymptomatic people because it means that the virus isn't that bad, but the bad side of asymptomatic infection, so people that have the virus and they fight it off without ever getting sick, it's good in some ways, but it's bad in others. So it's good in that it's probably not that severe, but bad in that they can spread it to multiple other people. And say, for example, they were a hospital worker um, if and they didn't show any symptoms, they fought it off, they're nice and healthy, but they have contact with sick people every day. So that one person who didn't realize they were sick uh, could have infected a lot of people who will get very, very sick from the virus and won't be able to fire it off. So that's why we worry about asymptomatic infections. The last thing that we worry about is super spreaders. So super spreaders are those people, um, they have high viral loads, lots of viral shedding, often asymptomatic, and um, very high numbers of contacts. So they're these nodes, these people that sit in the middle that have contacts with lots and lots and lots and lots of people. These people get sick,
but they don't really realize. And for some reason, some kind of genetic environmental interactions, they end up having extremely high viral loads and shed lots and lots and lots of virus, which impacts this R0 value. Where am I? R0 in that you get much higher chance of infection, you get much higher numbers of contacts and you also affect the length of infection. So their R0 are much higher. This is what happened in South Korea in there was someone that kept returned from China with the infection but showed no symptoms, attended a church, and the custom in that church was that you had thousands of people packed into a small building, really cramped, and you were on your knees and you praying with your heads kind of very closely cramped with everyone else. So you've got all these people kind of in a row, and then you have rows and rows of people, and this person here is sick and they're just kind of breathing on everyone else that's around them. And very quickly, we saw the numbers in South Korea skyrocket um, quite dramatically because all these people started getting sick. And it's like the, there were thousands of people in these churches because then this person might visit a different church next week and this person might. So it spread throughout this church service very, very, very quickly. And because it had about a week or so before symptoms emerged, there was this big silent epidemic going on and we were already well up the curve by the time people started showing symptoms. And by then it was very hard to slow down. So they were in an, epi in an epidemic. Okay, let's speak a little bit about coronavirus now, um, just for some information. I will preface this by saying that this is a very rapidly changing field at the moment. So what I'm saying now was accurate as at the end of February, so the 28th and the 29th of February 2020. Things will change very rapidly. Uh, more information will come out. Our noughts will be adjusted as we get epidemiological numbers. So will the lethality as it emerges more. There were more asymptomatic cases that never got detected during the spread. Um, and at the moment, the World Health Organization has not declared a pandemic, but the feeling within the community is that this uh, will be announced probably in the next coming weeks. A pandemic is likely to be called. So, the, so we're currently calling the infection, the clinical syndrome COVID-19, and it's essentially... Uh, a viral, it ranges from a viral, viral pneumonia is kind of in the middle ground, it ranges from common cold or asymptomatic through to viral pneumonia through to overwhelming infection. It's very severe pneumonia, organ failure, uh, and death. That's kind of the spectrum. From what we can tell, this makes up the vast majority of the population, and the people that get really sick typically have multiple comorbidities. Um, they're often elderly or young, very young. And because of those comorbidities and their age, they're often immunosuppressed. So these are the people that are often getting really, really sick. Most healthy people uh, will be able to fight off the infection relatively okay. COVID-19 is caused by a virus that's called SARS coronavirus 2. So SARS was severe acute, uh, a severe acute respiratory syndrome. This was also caused by a coronavirus. Um, and the current coronavirus is genetically very similar to SARS. So hence we've called it SARS coronavirus 2. It's a positive sense single strand RNA virus which just means the positive sense uh, means that the genetic code is um, essentially mRNA. It can be read directly by the ribosomes. It doesn't need to be transcribed first. And uh, yeah, positive sense. It looks like this, apparently. This is from the World Health Organization website. Um, so pretty typical. We. There's lots of evidence um, emerging, uh, lots of literature looking at the different proteins on the surface. And there is actually a paper that I was reading yesterday 
that got published yesterday that said that they've found that it's responsive to some of our anti uh, proteolytic enzyme and en- uh, anti proteolytic drugs that we use as antivirals. It looks like it may be responsive to them because it uses similar proteins to SARS and other coronaviruses in order to enter cells. So that's good news. Um, currently, uh, it's R naught is greater than one. We're currently estimating it's between two and three, but again, hard to say, uh, which means that it's definitely in this kind of upswing phase. It's going to continue growing, and we're seeing that around the world. If you look at the World Health Organization website, you can see the real-time tracking of it in different countries and worldwide. Um, what determines whether this becomes a pandemic is it's broadly a political thing when something becomes a pandemic, but by pandemic, we mean that there's an epidemic status in multiple countries. And in particular, when those countries are separated. So the reason why we're starting to suspect the pandemic may be called is that we have epidemic status in China, we have in Iran, we have it in Italy, we have it in South Korea, and other countries are starting to report increasing numbers as well. So it's starting to hit that phase where pandemic status may be cold. Pandemic is really, as I say, a political thing. What it means is that uh, it changes funding. It determines where funding can go on a government level. Uh, It means that there's surge capacity and different protocols and things like that implemented in healthcare settings. So hospitals uh, have access to greater resources. They start preparing uh, for a greater influx in sick patients. They start moving on patients that can probably go home. It kind of just changes how the system operates and where people can refer to. It also gives countries access to their emergency stockpiles. So um, the way Australia does it is we have large warehouses stockpiled with a bunch of antivirals, with personal protective equipment, all that kind of thing. And they can only be accessed when a pandemic status is called. Um, otherwise, it's locked away. So as I say, it's it's like a state of emergency in many ways, uh, where by calling a state of emergency, different services can then be accessed by uh, state governments and things like that. So that's coronavirus. <laughs> As I say, mainly it's infecting everyone, uh, but it looks like it's predominantly dangerous in populations that are already at risk. The lethality is currently predicted to be around 2 to 3%, which is slightly worrying. It, that is quite high. To give you uh, an estimate, the influenza kind of lethality rate is usually about 0.1-ish, um, but it varies depending on the season. So that's quite a significant jump up. It means that for every 10 people, two to three people will die. Every 10 people infected, two to three people will die. But the hard thing with predicting lethality is as I was talking about before, this is two to three percent of the cases that we know of. And in cases where there's a pandemic, most of the cases that we know of are people that are sick enough to present to hospital. Yes, there is screening and things going on at the moment where people are going door to door and if you've got a fever, you're taken in. But at the same time, there are going to be people that are asymptomatic uh, and aren't going to show any signs and they can have the infection. My guess is that the lethality rate will likely drop as we get to the end of the pandemic and we start doing more population level studies and we see that less people actually... Um, were presenting with the virus it was actually much greater in the population it was in a lot more people uh, and therefore the number of people infected is greater than we assumed uh, earlier on that being said i don't think it's going to drop down to this 0.01 percent so it's still very significant and as i say most people who are dying are the elderly and those who are already at poor health uh, kind of functioning So let's compare this to influenza. (coughs) So influenza infects nearly a billion people a year. So around a billion people a year are infected by influenza. Of that, three to five million have a severe illness. And then of that, 300 
to 600,000 die worldwide. So this influenza is a case of very high infectivity. So it's very contagious and therefore hits a lot of people. Uh, and even though it has that really low mortality rate, a large proportion of a large number, gross number of people still die. And influenza has massive impacts on the economy um, in terms of sick days and loss, loss of income, all those kinds of things. It's R0 value is around 1.5, but as I say, it varies from year to year. And also it varies depending on the population you talk about. Measles is one of the most infectious viruses that we know of. And it's R0 is around about 15-ish. Again, varying. And the thing that's scary with measles is that we can very easily prevent this, but because of the anti-vaccination movement, cases are actually on the rise again. And because it is so infectious and so contagious, uh, it, it can explode in populations very, very, very quickly. Um, as soon as you start dropping below the kind of threshold for herd immunity. And as I mentioned, so SARS coronavirus 2 is around about 2 to 3. So that's about where we're sitting at the moment. A quick note as well. When we talk about lethality, it's interesting to think about who's affected. So I've already mentioned who is mainly being affected by COVID-19. But if you look at the 1918 Spanish influenza, an interesting thing is this killed predominantly healthy individuals. It was young, fit, healthy people, 20s to 30s, fully functioning immune system that had massive increases in their mortality and lethality. In this case, it was due to immune overactivation. So they actually developed ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, because their cytokines attacked the lungs. They probably also attacked the kidneys and things like that as well. So these people, the more functioning your immune system was in this case, actually meant the more likely you were to die because it was death was a function of the immune system. People that, that were elderly and very young still, pa still passed away from it because of overwhelming infection. But people whose immune system didn't overactivate, so people kind of getting up to you know, 40s and 50s kind of thing, had a less chance of dying because their immune function was a little bit decreased and less likely to be overstimulated. So that's just a little fun fact. That's about it for today's shoot. Um, it's a lot that we covered a few different topics and I hope it's kind of clarified things. I guess the main things to understand is what an R0 is and what it represents and the basic idea of herd immunity, how it works, how these networks work and how we model infectious disease. Keep an eye on the World Health Organization for updates on coronavirus and COVID-19. Uh, they will have up-to-date recommendations and numbers and things like that. There's also a number of really good resources. The Doherty Institute, which is based in Melbourne, has done a lot of research into it. They were the first lab to culture the virus. Um, and their head of the institute has actually recently written for The Age in Melbourne uh, about kind of where coronavirus might lead us. There is a chance that as we hit pandemic stage, this virus may never leave the human population and it may be something that adapts over time to become less lethal and more contagious and become similar to influenza, uh, just a really severe cold um, that kind of circulates throughout the, the human population in seasons. Uh, not saying that that will happen, but it is a possibility. As I say, the Doherty Institute, I'll write that here, the Doherty Institute. You've also got the World Health Organization and the CDC. These are the places I would look for up-to-date information on coronavirus as it emerges. Uh, World Health Organization has got a few maps and things like that, which allow you to see the real-time spread of the disease. So I recommend checking those out. Uh, but I hope you've, this has been useful. And if it hasn't and you'd like to leave some feedback, please do. Uh, if it has been useful, also please let us know and continue to let us know of any topics that you'd like us to cover. Thank you very much for listening.